Uh, you used a 69 Plexi and a 70s trainer, is that right, on the album? Yeah. Uh, did that come over onto the tour with you? Did you use the same? No, I switched, uh, well it did initially, but about six months ago I had a, a big change. Um, uh, about 100 shows into the year, I was feeling very stifled, very bored creatively. And uh, I made the decision to well, first of all, I got this back from Gibson because Gibson had my 335 to make a signature model out of it. And uh, so I got this back and I decided I was gonna switch to uh, an old blackface Fender I'd had for a long, 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 long time and see how that would feel in the context of our band. Because I, I felt like what I was using was like fulfilling the childhood fantasy of like the rig of all these heroes of mine. But what it was doing was I, it was stifling me creatively, or at least that's how it felt because I get up and it's like, okay, I was doing an assimilation of what those guys were doing. But in the end, who cares really, because it's already been done. So, um, so for me, it was looking for a way to try and push myself to kind of get beyond that. And, and again, like I have these moments quite often in my life where it's like, I know something has to happen. I don't know how I'm going to deal with it, but it'll work out one way or another. So I just tried it and it worked well. And so now um, I tend to use like an old super reverb or an old deluxe reverb or something. And then I've got this old, um, I shipped one that lives in Europe here now, but I've got them in America too. These old Epiphone uh, Futuras that, um, Another, a big hero of mine, uh, Michael Bloomfield, um, he used him when he played with Bob Dylan and, uh, in the 60s. And uh, it's the shittiest sounding amp you've ever heard, but it's amazing and they're really rare. And I found one in Chicago, uh, my, my first one. <coughs> and I use those together and it's just a very, um, it doesn't sound like, uh, you know, that with the Fender together because uh, I leave the, the wobbly tremolo on the Epiphone on all the time and I turn the tremolo and the reverb on and off a lot on the Fender. A foot lot. Foot switching it. Yeah, with the little stock foot switch, you know. And then I'll go back and I'll turn the tremolo speed up or down or turn the reverb up or down. Like I work them, you know, uh, throughout the course of a show and it's never the same because we don't write set lists or anything. So it's never the same. But... Um, um, you know, so anyway, the point is, is when I get up every night and I start playing, it immediately sounds different to me. And that to me is more helpful because it's, it's helped me, you know, free myself, uh, if you will, from, from a lot of that. That's you really know? cool. Nice. Uh, you also used uh, Dwayne Allman's guitar on the album. How was that? And did you use that? more than you used your 335 or was that in conjunction? Yeah, I didn't use this at all on it because I didn't have it. This was at Gibson. Right. <coughs> I used, uh, yeah, I used Dwayne's guitar for most of it, um, pretty much all of it. And uh, a friend of mine owns it and uh, I've gotten to use it a bunch of times uh, at gigs and stuff like that. They brought it for me to play. Um, they've been very gracious with that guitar. That guitar has been played by a lot of different people. Uh, Nels Klein, who I'm a huge fan of, and uh, a bunch of, Derek, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, we just went down to record the record. We made the record in two days, and that guitar was there, and so I used it. And it was, I mean, it was a great honor, obviously, um, but what I keep trying to tell people, and some people don't take it, like, I mean this in a truthful way, not trying to over glorify or over romanticize something. It was a great honor to, to use it. It's a good instrument. It's a really good instrument. Like it's got, a, it sounds good. It's inspiring to play. You know, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it, it just, it was, it was what I was using. Uh, it was an honor to get to use it in that circumstance, but um, you know, it's not going to make you play great. And it certainly didn't help me or hurt me one way or another, but it made the experience more fun. Is that why you've now stuck to the 335? I can imagine that's why Gibson have chosen to... Well, I don't know why the hell Gibson has chosen because that's still uh, beyond me. <laughs> <coughs> but, um, no, this thing is just, you know, I, this, this is my guitar. I mean, like, um, I've gotten to play, 
I mean, at this point, I mean, it's stupid. It's insane. Like, I mean, 130 or 40 some odd bursts, real bursts, and, you know, dozens and dozens of old strats and telecasters and real flying Vs and, and, uh, and pre war Martins and, and D'Angelico's. And, I mean, just, you know, the whole gamut. I've got some incredible friends. Um, but the thing that's been good about that is it's shown me what a good instrument can be. It's also shown me what a shitty instrument can be. And, you know, this guitar um, is the one that really at the end of the day I'm most comfortable with and the one that feels like me. And when I got it, um, it was brand new. It didn't have a nick on it. And now it's beat to shit. So, you know, and I did that. So. You know, it's just, it feels comfortable. Again, it's like, I, I, you know, and also this is, you know, like if I put, a, like I've got, I still have this gorgeous 1960 Les Paul that a gentleman gave me to play and I still have possession of it. And um, when I put that on, I immediately feel different. Not in a bad way or a good way, but I feel different. So Whereas, your, your process is different when you play right, it. Right. Yeah. You know, it, like I, I, it, it's, it, I feel different. Whereas like when I put this on, I don't feel anything. I just feel comfortable. And so for me, it's like I'm not a, I'm not a big proponent of like changing guitars a bunch and stuff like that. <clears throat> I think that it's more important to make a connection with an instrument personally. Like uh, I always use the analogy, you know, you know, horn players, you know, like Cannonball Adderley or Wayne Shorter, who I love a lot, or Ornette Coleman, who I love a lot, you know, like, they didn't go to a gig with, you know, four saxes, you know, they had their axe, they had their sax, that they, that was their instrument. And there's something about that that I think is a little, it's, it's not as prevalent, yeah. in, at least in rock music and stuff like that. I think it's become a little bit more showy. Which, you know, again, it's entertainment in the end. I mean, different structure, different folks, but I prefer the, the other, you know. Can you give us some examples of some tones you can get out of? Of tones? First of all, one of the big things is you, you can get a very different sound depending upon where you pick. So if you pick up here, it's a little rounder than. And I wiggle the neck quite a bit instead of a vibrato unit. And obviously, um, running through the normal rig, you know, I just, you know, you play quiet. And then, you know, you have all your gain that you'll ever need just in there. Um, and then one thing I had Joe Glazer do in Nashville, who's been a longtime friend of mine, is I had him put this push pole in here, which makes this go out of phase um, in the middle, so you can sound like T-Bone Walker. So I use that quite a bit because it can also be in phase for the. I use that quite a bit. And then obviously the neck pickup is just the neck pickup and uh, fingers 
you know, that's like the uh, very like Lightning Hopkins kind of stuff. John Lee Hooker. Muddy Waters too. So, so yeah, and then I, I do, you know, I do stuff behind the bridge a lot, uh, rhythmic stuff, which when it's loud and I've got um, like more harmonics going on, I can play with the harmonics behind the bridge a little bit. And, um, and then, you know, I use the side of my pick and do, you know, sort of DJ kind of stuff as well, you know, depend it all depends. I mean, it's, <clears throat> they're all little things. And then of course, you know, I can't really do it cause it's not feeding back, but the, you know, the, the kind of, kind of like creating a rhythmic vamp yeah. with the switch when you turn one of the volumes off, I do that sometimes. So, I mean, but that's the thing is, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're only limited by your own imagination because there's so much that you can do. And also, I mean, I've done it a couple of times, but I, 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 I hit harmonics a lot, you know, like where I'm playing, like if I'm... That kind of thing. Um, or just in simpler passages. Doing stuff like that. Doing pinch harmonic stuff. Um, you know, any, any of the above, you know, it's kind of all, you know, whatever I need is kind of there. And I have a wah-wah pedal that I have, and I'll use that for, um, you know, normal conventional stuff. But then also, again, for atmospherics and improvisations and stuff like that, you know, I can use it obviously as a graphic filter. I can use it, um, again, as a rhythmic thing. I like, ryth I like doing things that are rhythmic. So it's like whether I'm doing any of these like weird unorthodox things that I do, I like essentially like <clears throat> almost in a techno or, a, um, or an EDM kind of way, using it as a rhythmic counterpoint when we're in the middle of improvisations because usually our improvs end with a drop, which is a lot like EDM. And so, you know, it's like whatever I can do to kind of rhythmically fuck with what's going on, you know? And so I'll do, you know, all the above of that. And you, I can also do stuff with the bottleneck. You know, I mean, there's the, you know, the very classic Dwayne Almany where you do the bird sounds, you know, that kind of thing, you know? You know, that kind of thing where if you've got a bunch of tremolo and a bunch of reverb going on, you can kind of create a spatial thing just with that. And also you can play rhythmic with this where you can kind of like. Where I'm now if I play the E and the, the A together, I'm actually making somewhat of a disjointed chord. You know, that kind of stuff, you know. So it's just experimenting, just, you know, whatever strikes me when I'm playing. The biggest tip I can give is hand strength means everything, okay? And when I say, it, when I, when I say that, you know, when I was in this club band in Nashville and I was having to play really fast bluegrass stuff, I dedicated myself for a while just so I could freaking play it, you know? And, but what happened was, is my normal hand strength for just bending to a note and being able to vibrato well and not linger. Because you, the thing that surprises me is, you know, even with p bands, working bands, people have record deals, people that are famous, whatever, you'd be surprised how many guys couldn't keep it. Don't let it go. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Like, that should be, like, to me, that's like a fundamental, because I couldn't at one point, okay? <clears throat> but the thing is, is that just sitting, that's muscle memory. That's subtle, but it's muscle memory. But the thing is, is that if, you, if, you've got a, if you've got a handle on hand strength, 
then you can pile anything you want on top of it and you've got a really nice firm foundation because what that hand strength is going to give you is you have command over the neck you know and then the other thing that i'll say as far as a, a tip <coughs> is a guitar is a lot like a, a drum or a piano in that the harder you hit it the more it's going to choke the more it's going to you're going to get a lot of attack but the note's going to die off whereas if you String's still vibrating. Yeah, it just keeps going because the string can vibrate. And so, and it's just like with a drummer. Like if you've got a, if you've got a drummer who hits way too freaking hard, you're going to get all this attack, but there's going to be no tone in the drum. And so guitar is a lot like that. And so much like I'd lost a lot of dexterity in my left hand where I didn't have a lot of hand strength, I was playing way too hard over here, because, m mostly just because I was trying to play at tempo and I was, I was tensing my arm and tensing my wrist. And, but the thing is that I've worked really hard over time to have a lighter approach with my right hand so I can get more tone out of the instrument. Because obviously you want, you know, uh, how shall I say, like dynamic range is everything in music. You know, to me, music should be from a whisper to a scream and everything in between. <laughs> and um, the thing is, is that you should be able to accomplish that without touching a volume knob. You should be able to... So you can punctuate what you're saying like you would when you're speaking, because you want to punctuate certain things, you know. And to me, the you know, the, the beauty of, because everything I do is essentially very simple. And the beauty of the great simple players, whether you're talking about Ry Cooter or whether you're talking about Albert King or whether you're talking about any number of guys, Kirk, Kirk Cobain, you know, um, is <coughs> phrasing, being able to, being able to say, maybe not so much with Kirk, because Kirk was such a, he phrased with his mouth, but uh, but in any any sense, the point I'm trying to make is is uh, it's it's a lot easier to kind of fill up space with notes and bullshit than it is to actually breathe and actually play conversationally, and um, and so getting tone out of the instrument by not playing too hard and having you know spending time like actually sitting by yourself and spending time working on pick technique or lack thereof in a way and working on your hand strength. I mean, you're going to, it's going to exponential. And this is something that you could do in a month's time. You see a hell of a change in, in just a month of concentrating on it. Yeah, because it's quick because, because you're, you know, our muscle reflexes are quick and these are simple, basic things. But, you know, again, like, you know, I learned to play by listening to records, you know, and I didn't have the aid of, of, uh, of, of a lot of the resources that we have today. And I learned from a lot of old timers, you know, and a lot of these kind of basic things are things that I, I think have gotten lost a little bit in the current age because, because they are not exciting, because they're almost kind of boring. They're very basic. But the thing is, is that it's those basic things that inherently I think make some of the players that I look up to the most so special because because it is, it's so much more, I was just talking in there, you know, we were talking about Questlove, because I was talking about my love of the voodoo record that D'Angelo made in 1999 with Questlove and Pino Palladino on it. And you know, Quest is, I think, the, the most brilliant, chill drummer ever. And that's so hard, man, it's so easier to get behind a drum kit and bash the shit out of it. You know, it's harder to make something feel good. So it's all that, beauty and simplicity.